uh, from Mainz. Um, and by the way, we're running a workshop in Mainz next week. So, oh wait, you can watch. Can watch it on there. Who, who feel this? Uh, yeah. So it's not intended to be a hybrid. No. Oh, okay. So, oh, okay. Uh, okay. Well, then, so it's a very exclusive. Forget about it. Exclusive. Forget what I said. Forget what I said. <laughs> you can, you can, you can, you can crash. Uh, these it. are not. These are not my rules. Yeah, the we, rules there's an this. institute. Uh, MITP has all sorts of rules. Um, so the, the title is 3D BPS indices, Q difference equations, and non perturbative corrections. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, very much for the opportunity to speak at this uh, nice uh, workshop. By looking at the titles, I noticed that uh, maybe I'm working a bit on an exotic topic here. There, I, I don't think that there are many talks on 3D indices, 3D gauge theory. So I, I decided to, to try to give a bit of a general overview talk. So this is a topic that I've been working uh, in particular with, with my collaborator Peter Meyer for a couple of years now. And what I'm going to talk about today is mainly based on a paper which also appeared, I think, two years ago and uh, uh, some work which hopefully is going to appear. I'm not making any predictions any longer, but should be, uh, appear in the next couple of weeks. Okay, so uh, so what's the setup uh, for the physicist? It's an n equals uh, uh, three dimensional n equals two gauge theory. And uh, if you have such a gauge theory, then uh, we can uh, we we can have fixed branches. And uh, for the mathematicians, what this is, it, there's a manifold involved, which we call, uh, call it a target space. So it's a Kähler target space, space manifold X, which uh, uh, in this uh, in this setup is realized as a symplectic quotient, or if you think more algebraically about it, it's some uh, some sort of a GIT quotient, as a GIT quotient that we've also seen. Uh, in the previous talk, and um, a gauge theory comes with a with a compact Lie group, a gauge group G, and this GIT quotient arises from uh, a vector space, and the vector space uh, is is generated by the the, the chiral fields, so, so the matter spectrum in this theory, and it's divided by uh, the complexification of this uh, with the reductive group that we are dividing by the complexification of the gauge group. So if you have such a setup, and this is mainly the quantity I'm going to talk about today, you can uh, calculate a 3D index, or sometimes it's also called a 3D half index. And uh, uh, so this is an index of uh, boundary GPS operators. If we put this theory on a three-dimensional manifold, and this three-dimensional manifold has a particular structure. So topologically, it's an S1 times a bis two, but uh, uh, it has a bit more structure to it. So it comes with a metric in the phys physical setting. So it's really a uh, a disk fibered over the S1. So logically, it's, a, it's a, just a product, but metric-wise, it's a disk fibered over the S1. And when you go around the S1, Kind of start rotating this disk, and this is uh, parameterized by this parameter Q. Okay, and if you have, uh, if you want to count these things, then there's a certain index, and this index is roughly speaking the following: you have uh, take a, a trace, and since this is a uh, this is a space with a with a boundary, uh, namely it has a torus as a as a boundary, uh, you have to uh, you have to take a trace where you impose on your on the, on the field and operate a certain boundary conditions and uh, the kind of trace you can take. Uh, so it's an index. So you weigh uh, uh, in, uh, in the silver space what you're tracing. You have uh, a gradation with bosonic and fermionic uh, modes. You weigh this with the fermion number. And then uh, there are some fugacities. So one is Q. So Q goes together with the Lorentz generator uh, that you have in the theory of this disk together with what is called an R symmetry generator and possibly additional uh, symmetries you have in the theory called flavor symmetries. So this is the kind of index that you can compute. So F is the generator of the flavor symmetry. 
So it's a, you can think of this as a symmetry of this uh, GID quotient. Uh, J is the spin generator on this disk and R. There is an additional symmetry in the supersymmetric series. So it's a generator of the corresponding D1R symmetry. And this is uh, certainly not an index that, that, uh, that we have looked for the first time. So this has been uh, introduced for the first time by Beam. Uh, Beam the happy in back in 2012. Then got uh, Kukov and Putrov in uh, two papers in 2013. Various contexts have studied this index. And what we are mainly using is the formulation of the Dimorphte. What am I? Dimorphte. Dimorphte. Gayoto. That's From uh, 2017. There are many other works on this on this top. That's kept teeth. This is that's kept. I think he's it's not the same person. Huh? Not a, ah, sorry, yes. Yeah. So you can look at that one. So they are they're different, they are different people, and uh, yeah, it's Paquette. Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Uh, so for the purpose of this talk, I will actually use a particular simple setup, but the simplest setup you can think of concerning the gauge group. So if I, I just take the gauge group to, to be U1, then the kind of GIT quotients we are studying are essential, very basic examples of Doric varieties. And, uh, and moreover, uh, like I said, we have to impose boundary conditions on the various uh, fields that we have in the theory. So such a gauge theory comes as a gauge boson and in particular, we also have to impose a boundary condition for the gauge boson. And the one we choose or the one which is kind of uh, the richest to think about is we take directly boundary conditions, conditions for the gauge boson. So if you do this, then you can study uh, so then this, uh, for this particular uh, setup, the index takes a very specific form. It now depends on uh, three fugacities, or it could depend on more, but these are the fugacities that we're interested in. So uh, Q is this parameter, which we have universally in this index, this little Q. Big Q um, is, uh, is a global symmetry, which is called in three dimensions, uh, you want topological, so that's the dual symmetry to that to that gauge group. Uh, so this is dual G, which in our case is U1. Uh, then what is S? And S has to do with this choice of boundary conditions. So if we impose directly boundary conditions, it means that uh, we don't have uh, a gauge boson at the boundary in particular, because we have set it to zero with this directly boundary conditions. But what it implies is that since we have uh, this, uh, this, this gauge symmetry G, which in our case is U1, you still have a remnant of this at the boundary as a global symmetry. And that global symmetry at the boundary is uh, usually denoted by U, U1 partial. And this is nothing else but uh, G restricted to the boundary. Okay, so we have a quantity which depends on these uh, on these uh, three variables, uh, this parameter Q, then uh, this big Q, and this S. Okay, so this has a char characteristic expansion over the integers Q to the M, and then there are some coefficient functions Y, M, uh, S, and Q. And uh, let me say a few words about uh, about what you get here. So this is uh, this is a sum of a boundary 
monopole sectors that you have in this theory. This, this whole thing here is a Q bilateral series. So it is formal, it's a formal, formal series in Q and Q inverse. And uh, and this 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 part here is just something that comes from the matter fields. And one thing that I haven't talked about, they are in three dimensions. There are particular terms you can add to these uh, to these theories, topological terms, but they show up in this index. They are the so-called John Simon's terms. So they are specific choices. So uh, how does this look like in practice? Well, in practice, uh, let me just uh, give you an example, or let me just be schematic here. So how do the John Simons terms look like? So that gives you a factor of Q to the one half uh, A times M squared plus BM, where A and B are, cho are choices of John Simon levels. So A is, uh, is uh, U1 cross U1, John Simon's level, and B is a U1 times U1R, John Simon's level, for the experts, and they're suitably quantized. Actually, they're effective, so-called effective John Simon's level. And uh, also, how does, uh, how does the matter index look like? They are very concrete formulas, matter index for a chiral, chiral multiplet in that theory. So again, we have two kinds of situations. Either we can impose, impose Neumann boundary conditions, say, to the scalar field in that multiplet, and then the boundary conditions of the remaining fields of these multiplets are, are gover governed by supersymmetry. And then what you get is something as alpha uh, Q to the alpha M, Q to the R half Q in terms of these Ohama symbols. So this alpha here is the U1, the U1 charge. So the representation with respect to the gauge group, S is this fugacity that we had, and Q is this little Q. And if you have directly boundary conditions, then you get a similar expression, just, uh, uh, sorry, this is to the minus one. Then you get a similar expression, but you get it in the, uh, in the numerator of M one minus R half U to infinity. So what are these Pochhammer symbols? These Pochhammer symbols. So for if the magnitude of this variable Q, which we take to be, uh, well, here it's still a formal variable, but we can think of this as, uh, as, uh, uh, as, as a complex variable which, uh, which we choose to have the magnitude smaller than one. Another choice would be to be bigger than one. This is actually equivalent at the end of the day, but that's our choice. But if you do this, then the Q Hohammer symbol is just nothing else but this infinite product, the following form. Okay. And then what you, so depending what, what spectrum you have and what choices of John Simon's terms you have, you can immediately calculate this index by just uh, uh, by just taking this formula and writing it as a product of all these contributions that you get from all these matter fields. Yes. Uh, these these are examples, or these uh, so in this theory where we have uh, uh, the, the gauge theory is U one, and you have if you have this is the contribution of a single chiral field. If it has Neumann boundary condition, it's uh, it's one over Pochhammer factor of that sort. If you have directly boundary conditions, uh, you have uh, you have this factor in the numerator. And I should have mentioned so R is the U one R charge, alpha is the gauge charge. Under here. Yes, y yes. So here appears the index M. So you have to sum over so this bilateral formal this bilateral series. It's just this infinite sum for the integers of all these contributions. Yep. Uh, 
I mean, what you could do, okay, so I mean, certainly you can talk about more general gauge groups and more general GIT quotients, and then you could also calculate that index. I will give you a geometric interpretation of that index in a second. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, uh, good. Yeah, so uh, so this Y stands, uh, so one, if you want one global, so this stands for flavor symmetry, any global symmetry. So one example in this case, so you should think of this Y uh, in this particular example, just of the Q and the S. But uh, in general, uh, you're right. I mean, there could be more flavor symmetries, in particular, if you have theoretical varieties, you can uh, look at uh, the equivariant setup, and then you would have you would have for every C star symmetry of the toric variety, you would have an additional Y if you want to keep track of it. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. No, A is just in this case, it's just an uh, it's just uh, integer or half integer. Um, okay, so um, let's talk about properties of the 3D index point. Um, so uh, one, one result that we have, again, now in this working process, we make more precise, but in, it also has been already worked out in collaboration with Otto and Ominida and Alexander Tabler, is that if you have uh, that this, uh, we have the scalar target X, that, like I said, if you, if you just think about it algebraically, think about the GIT quotient, um, there is an identification of this U1 partial capacity you can make that you identify as is p to the minus one, which is nothing else but the churn character of H, where H is the hyperplane bundle uh, of X. So in this case, where we have a single U1, uh, this uh, the, 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 we also have a single, as a gauge group, we have a single U1 partial and there is also a single H in this setup, but it certainly has an immediate generalization to more general toric varieties or even more general GIT quotients. Then uh, we can look at this index now given in terms of where we set S to this uh, churn character there or to this inverse churn character Q. And then this is proportional up to some numerical factors, which I'm not taking track of for the purpose of this talk. You can expand this out into a quantity i of x, which now depends on this, this, uh, this, uh, this h, or what I mean by this, the churn class of this hyperplane one plus. And then uh, since, uh, since, since this is, uh, well, if you think of this as this divisor, then this automatically truncates uh, as the dimension, the complex dimension, I mean, the highest uh, form you can have is the complex dimension of this manifold X. So all the terms that are uh, higher in degree of H, uh, they, they vanish upon this identification if you do this expansion. And this I X of H comma U, uh, this has a very geometric meaning. This is sometimes called a Q period, or uh, it's called the K-theoretic uh, given part I function of this uh, of this target space or of this GIT quotient X. So what is this I function? Uh, this I function, I mean, we, we have uh, kind of uh, heard it also in the previous talk, the cohomological version of this. This I function is a generating function of certain invariants you can calculate on these target X. And what are these? Uh, these, this is a generating function, a generating function of uh, 
holomorphic Euler characteristics on the moduli space of stable maps of genus zero. And I write an example, we'll say with one map point of X, which is the following form. So uh, Lee has constructed, a student of Gibenthal has constructed a structure sheaf, uh, a former student of Gibenthal, I should say, established professor in this field, has established a, a virtual um, uh, structure sheaf on this moduli space of stable maps. And this allows you to actually calculate Euler characteristics, which are of the following form. So if you have on this moduli space of stable maps, one mark points, we can take, for instance, the evaluation map, uh, and compute quantities like this, powers of P to some power, take this bundle, this, uh, this line bundle P to some power K, and uh, divide by possibly, and this is where this Q shows up, where we have this tautological bundle on this moduli space of stable maps, where this is the cotangent line that we get from these marked points. And these are the type of Euler characteristics which are encoded in this generating part sheet. So uh, these numbers are integers. And just as a little side remark, uh, you recover uh, from, yes. Uh, this is the moduli space of stable maps from genus zero with one mark point into X. Uh, the virtual dimension of that guy depends on, uh, well, I don't have the formula at the top of my head. It's the usual formula uh, that you know and love. I mean, there's, uh, I don't know, dimension of X, uh, where the first term plus. Uh, that is right. I mean, this formula depends on the first, I mean, the, the virtual dimension of this formula depends on the first chunk of the dimension of the first churn class and of the genus. And this generating function that we are discussing are the genus zero. Okay, just as a little side remark to uh, what, we've, what we've seen in the previous talk. So if you then Q to one, then you recover in this limit, you recover quantum cohomology. Cohomology. Uh, and as such, uh, what you also recover, uh, you 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 recover uh, rational. These are rational numbers, rational genus zero from a Fitton invariance. And uh, well, a particular instance that we physicists love to study is if you have a Calabi-Yau threefold, then we know that there's a re re uh, resummation of these from a Fitton in invariance to Gupakuma Waffe invariance, which are integers. And this resumption is kind of based uh, of also relating these uh, uh, gromophyton invariants from a target space perspective to, a, to a one dimension higher by adding an additional S1. And you can think of this, uh, this Euler characteristic, yet another resumption of the gromophyton invariants, which are integral, but they are not specific to uh, any Calabi-Yau or anything that works in general. And uh, this is a kind of, a, from a physics perspective, a very similar idea because there is no reason for the chromophyton invariants to be uh, integral because they don't stem from an index. However, if you, uh, if you, calculate, um, if you calculate these, uh, these generating functions or this counting function of UTS operators, uh, then it's very natural that they are integral numbers. And uh, uh, so what, what we are saying is that, that these integers from that perspective, they're kind of a world sheet, uh, world, world sheet World sheet theory lift from two dimensions to three dimensions by also including additional F1, which make them integral. So that's insight. No, 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 uh, you have to be careful. So the, the Euler characteristic is always integer. We are not doing intersection theory. So uh, actually uh, you're raising a very good question since this is a stack. So you have possibly some obifold action on this. Um, so it's a bit tricky, and this makes it actually also complicated to calculate these numbers, uh, to define these uh, numbers properly. Uh, and there is uh, what is called uh, uh, an inertia manifold, that, which has several components that they attribute to the stack. And then you calculate contributions from uh, each component in this inertia manifold, and that is always guaranteed to give you an image. Uh, yes, uh, so you're right. So uh, yes, uh, indeed. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you. 
the uh, okay so these are actually rational i mean integral coefficients with rational uh, functions in q but just to be in the safe side let me regulate this. okay yes um um yeah so this, so this is in general so you you when you take the q to one limit you always recover uh the uh the quantum cohomology invariance the chromophyton invariance i'm just saying that uh in the case that this is calabi i mean you can do this also for pano or uh in principle if you're powerful enough to the results that we are heard previously there should also be a limit when you look at the structure constants of these rings that we talked about in the previous talk they should also rise in that they should also rise in that limit. Yeah. uh is there a relation to higher genus so uh what is known okay so this is an interesting question to higher genus uh for color we are three folds um um well Okay, we can also discuss that afterwards a bit. But uh, for Calabiao threefolds, uh, in principle, these these things I have been defined, um, but it's difficult to compute them. Let me put it this way. I mean, yeah, so far. Uh, how you calculate it? Okay, so you, one way is you calculate it by localization, or the other way that I've been sketching here, uh, you just calculate it from this index. So we know, so you look at the spectrum, you can write down this. Uh, so either you do a direct counting of these uh, BPS operators or you get it from localization. Yeah. So there are two ways of obtaining it. Yeah. Okay, but for U1 theories or for, uh, well, I mean, more general for uh, well, general Lie groups G, I mean, these, these formulas are known. So in principle, you can, as a starting point, you can write down this index. Okay. Um, when we set uh, Q to minus one, uh, so t uh, sending Q to roots of unity is an interesting question. And I, I'm afraid I don't have a good answer for this. And I've been asked this uh, in many talks, but uh, uh, I, I, I don't know what, uh, what, uh, how to interpret geometrically these uh, various limits. Yeah. Okay. Okay, today I don't want to really talk too much about these, these invariants, but I want to uh, look a bit at uh, more the analytic properties of these uh, of these indices. Sorry. Uh, sometimes. Uh, sporadically, and we also don't understand the systematics of this. So there's an interesting connection to uh, uh, this uh, uh, this block group and these CFTs uh, that show up in this nouns list of CFTs. And we get these modular functions that we can construct uh, from these block group considerations, uh, sporadic for specific uh, choices of gauge groups and matter fields and transcendence levels, but we don't understand the systematic of this. Maybe we can also discuss that where it's going in a slide. But... Uh, there are, I think there are relations to that, yes, but I'm, I, I'm afraid I don't really have to there there. But... Um, okay. Um, so, uh, what's interesting to know is uh, that these, these, uh, these eyes, one, and also these I axes, uh, they fulfill so, uh, what is called a Q difference equation. 
equation. So in other words, so we have a Q difference operator L, which is uh, a finite sum. So this difference operator has some order n, and it has some coefficients. So Q, uh, Q we, we think of a, having a particular value, uh, but you can also think of this as a polynomial both in Q and a big Q and little Q. But if you uh, set little Q to a particular complex value, which is uh, the absolute small value than one, then think of this as polynomials in, in Q. And then we have this, this difference operator sigma k, where sigma acts on q, or if you commute it as q, it just multiplies it with a little q. Okay. And now the statement is that, um, and I guess I want t not unequal to zero and t n unequal to zero and the full model. And uh, so you can find such an operator that uh, these these uh, these i functions uh, these i functions are nilliate. Okay, so this also has a physical interpretation. So this uh, this uh, this difference operator uh, is actually a word identity. What identity of Wilson lines? lines in this uh, 3D uh, gauge theory that we are talking about. Okay, but let me, uh, let me maybe focus a bit more on this difference equations. So actually, uh, there are nice analytic properties of solutions to these uh, two difference equations. And uh, one thing is actually, and maybe as a reference, I mean, uh, there is also many recent literature, but many of the things I learned from uh, some old work by Saloy from 2003. And then there is uh, also by Saloy and collaborators. I mean, this is also part of the PhD thesis, PhD thesis of Saloy. Uh, uh, this, this has been discussed. Um, so one, one important aspect of these uh, Q-difference equations is, so if you have a meromorphic solution at, say, in some open ring around zero, uh, Q smaller epsilon, then what autom automatically follows that you have a meromorphic, you can extend this to a meromorphic, uniquely extend this to a meromorphic solution over C star. And this is this peculiar feature uh, of, uh, of two difference equations. So if you think about this, what does this, this difference operator do? I mean, it, is, it, it essentially uh, just replaces the argument of any function it's the Q by, by multiplying by little Q. But since the magnitude of little Q is unequal to zero, uh, in our case, it's smaller than zero, by acting with the sigma or the inverse sigma, you can gradually always analytically extend using this difference operator uh, this uh, to the next epsilon step. And the only thing you're going to do is, since these are polynomials in Q, uh, the worst that can happen is that uh, you introduce by dividing by these uh, coefficients, you introduce another pole, but that doesn't violate uh, the property that's going to be a meromorphic function. So, so if you have a meromorphic function in this uh, in in some small ring around zero, it automatically analytically extends to a meromorphic solution. Okay. Um, so the other thing, similar what you uh, used for differential equations, you can also write down a first order matrix equation. Uh, first order matrix equation, sigma F, some connection matrix A, which also depends on Q, but like I said, Q, you think of a fixed constant for now, F, 
where in the usual way, uh, where we write, uh, where we write this vector f, where we try to find a solution, or where if f is a solution, then the vector f is a solution. This type is my n minus one to be f. Okay, so if you have now um, a set, a complete set of local solutions, um, say x zero, f one through fn. So if you have an end or the difference equation and they are also end solutions at say zero smaller q smaller epsilon. And let's say we have another set of solutions g1 to gn at zero smaller q inverse epsilon. Then we already know that these solutions by what we've said before they all, uh, so they should be meromorphic, I should say. Meromorphic. Also meromorphic. Then they automatically extend to solutions of a whole of C star. And one consequence of this is that we must be able to rewrite this, this matrix of uh, solutions by some matrix P and this P is called a Birkhoff matrix. And this P has a specific property. If we act with sigma on P, then it must be invariant because if it were not invariant, then you can easily convince yourself uh, if this is a solution, that is a solution. As a consequence, this P has to be invariant. So in another consequence of this so we have now a matrix uh, uh, translating these two solutions, which is invariant under sigma. So a consequence of this is that that P is actually a matrix of elliptic functions, meromorphic elliptic functions on the elliptic curve E tau, which is C star divided by Q to the C where Q little q and this is one reason why it's nice to choose q to be smaller than one you can identify so that the complex structure parameter of that elliptic curve is the essentially the exponent of this uh, of the little q oh, yes Uh, yeah, so in small, uh, so in small uh, Q, um, this is actually also an interesting thing, which has was related to this previous uh, question. It actually, at least for these, uh, in the context of these given pole i functions, it has also a very specific pole structure in small Q. Namely, it has only poles at uh, roots of unity. So uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, that's yeah. Okay. Uh, The infinite products I wrote down. Uh, yes, so ho hold on. Um, uh, it has it, that 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 is true, but it has uh, so the pole structures you get. So okay, so this depends a bit what you plug in for these gasities. But uh, if you set all these equivariant parameters to zero at the end. Uh, the poles you get, and this is very specific to this uh, K-theoretic given pole I functions. You only have poles in little q uh, along uh, roots of unity, but yeah, infinitely. But... Okay, so I'm. Um, uh, so let me actually put this. So, uh, so this is very nice to know that this uh, this matrix P is a matrix of elliptic functions. But uh, well, I guess maybe you're not powerful enough. But for many examples, even though we can determine these local solutions, and because these local solutions are often given in terms of an infinite series, uh, 
even though we know that they are meromorphic functions over C star, we have a hard time finding analytic expressions actually for these uh, for these specific uh, for these Birkhoff matrices. I mean, working out these elliptic functions in general is uh, in general not not so straightforward. But for some simple examples, and one example I would like to present here because it's particularly simple uh, for the conifold, um, and I tell you in a second what geometry I mean by this. We can actually calculate that p explicitly, and then there are a few other examples where we can do this. So uh, this consists of four chiral fields in this case. Um, and again, the gauge group was U1, we said. So it has a single U1 charge. So uh, we have chiral fields plus one, plus one, and we have chiral fields minus one, minus one. So for this simple geometry, we have actually, this theory has two Higgs branches, Higgs branches, And they both, they're related by, geometrically, they're related by a flop. And they look, yeah. so the two GIT coefficients you can, uh, uh, you can construct out of this, uh, that are geometric are these, uh, are these two flop faces, which are these result, these result conifold. And now we can go ahead and go through this program uh, and actually, so I mean, write down the corresponding operator L, uh, solve these solutions. So let me uh, let me just give you a flavor of this. So the solution at uh, Q equals zero. How does this look like? So uh, so there's going to be if you do this uh, if you do this expansion in in H if you do it here. So you have uh, a zero and a two form class. So this is uh, morally speaking h to the zero, and h to the one. Uh, but then uh, we also would like to have some classes for these uh, for these non-compact direction. And this goes back to Alfred's question. We actually have to go to equivariant setting now and calculate some equivariant cohomology classes. But morally speaking, uh, if you do that, what we can extract is also a four-form and six-form uh, class with compact support. And heuristically, to think of this as corresponding to something like H2 squared, H3 squared, but really what we are calculating are some equivariant cohomology classes, but let me not uh, go uh, into this discussion here. And uh, then uh, if, you, if you do this whole thing equivariant, and at the end, you can again send the equivariant parameters to zero if you want, then we get a, a period solution around zero. Uh, which takes the following form. So one in this case is a solution minus LQ is a solution. I'll tell you in a second what this is. LQ over two plus a Q generalization of Li two. And then let me not write the third one because it gets a bit more involved. So it involves a generalization of, uh, of Li, a Q generalization of Li three. So what are these things? Well, log Q, is essentially the logarithmic derivative of a theta function uh, uh, of a theta function on this elliptic curve. And uh, the important thing of taking this logarithmic derivative, so the theta function is, a, this is meromorphic, the way we've written it, meromorphic uh, in C star. And then if you take uh, the logarithmic derivative, we still get something more amorphic at C star. But the interesting property is if we, if we act with this difference operator on LQ, then we get that back LQ plus one. So it behaves a bit like, uh, uh, like the monodromy of a logarithm when we act with the Q difference operator. Okay, and like I said, this lead to Q, is a certain generalization of Li2 in the sense that when we send Q uh, again to one, to the cohomology limit, we get uh, the ordinary Li2 and it takes the following form. It's a series from one infinity to K. And then there is also a choice of John Simons. The choice of John Simons level enters here that I mentioned before. And then there is one minus two to the K squared. 
And like I said, there appears something of generalization of Lee three and the third line. And this has uh, the characteristic features. It has denominators which go with uh, the cube. And again, if you take the Q equal to one limit, you get Lee three of that, that function. Uh, the, the, uh, what do you mean with the ordinary? Uh, so you mean the, the Fadev uh, quantum dialogarithm? Now this will appear later on. So this is not just uh, this is not just a, a, a Pochhammer symbol. This relates to uh, so if you start differentiating this, you get similarly uh, similarly like uh, you are from the ordinary uh, dialogarithm. When you just start differentiating this, you get uh, you get this L cube. When you start differentiating this, then you get a Pochhammer symbol. Okay. So now you can do uh, the same story for the uh, for the other for the other solution as well. Uh, let me not go into this, but let me maybe, because I'm running out of time, let me uh, just make an observation. So if we, if we do this, we can now work out, I mean, we work out this solution, the solution at the other end, we can work out the, uh, and again, what I should maybe stress, it's this function, which contains the, the cohomological, uh, the, the K-theoretic, uh, Gromophyton invariants or the K invariant, these, these Euler characteristics that I've been talking about. So, this is the generation function which contains this information. And similarly, you can extract it from the lab here as well. Okay. So, one observation is that this Birkhoff matrix, of matrix, um, cancels, holds, uh, of solution holes in the solutions infinity. So when we do this, for instance, for the four form part, namely for the part that I've written down here rather explicitly, you get uh, the following formula that you can write uh, this particular period, Q period, in the following fashion. So here you get an elliptic function, which is essentially given by the by a constant plus the wire stress P function written in this multiplicative variables times the period one, which we also have on the other side for Q inverse equal to zero plus, plus a minus one. So minus one is also clearly an elliptic function. A constant is an elliptic function. Q tilde, uh, where Q tilde is essentially the same uh, quantity that we had here, just written in the inverse variable, where W, the W is Q to the inverse. So now what we see here is the following property. So we, first of all, we see that we have two elliptic functions. So these are the ones which come from the Birkhoff matrix. And then the other thing we see is that this, uh, actually when you analyze these functions more carefully, so this, uh, this is holomorphic at Q equals zero. This is holomorphic at W equals zero. And these, and, uh, and these they are meromorphic, meromorphic functions on C star. So what you see is that the poles of, uh, of, this, uh, of this function, uh, they get by these meromorphic functions, they get canceled because the poles that we have here, if we go further out in Q, they are not appear there. So this thing has different poles. So the, 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 the job of, of this, this factor, but with this essentially comes from a John Simon's term, but in particular of this factor is to cancel the poles that we have in one expansion with the poles of the of the other expansion. Okay, and unfortunately, I'm a bit running out of time. But let me just uh, say 
how we now interpret this or how we use this. And this goes a bit to Murat's, well, maybe to Murat's question. Yes. What, the little? No, this, this is important. This does not have a logarithmic branch cut. It just has an essential single. So the, the price you pay is that it has an essential singularity at Q equals zero. But it behaves, uh, it behaves as a logarithm if you send little Q to one. Or, or as a matter of fact, if you send little Q to one, uh, then uh, uh, th this is an interesting story in its own right. This is described already in this thesis by Zora. If you, I mean, it's a bit, it depends how you precisely take this limit for these functions, Q goes to one, but then what you get is, is actually a logarithm. Um, so let me just, uh, uh, just maybe conclude by, uh, by saying the following. So if you have now this equation, um, so this is maybe part three, non perturbative corrections, we can now, and this works in general, but uh, for the conifold, it works particularly nicely and uh, you can carry it out uh, more, uh, yeah, essentially analytically. So if you introduce also S dual variables, variables, which come from an S transformation, maybe Q tilde, is if you take this elliptic curve and do an S transformation of the modulus of this elliptic curve, there's a natural, uh, associated Q, which we, let's call this Q tilde, which is Q divided by one over Q. So this is essentially E to the two pi I U divided by tau, if Q is E to the two pi I U. And similarly, there's Q, which is E to the two pi I divided by tau to the minus one. And, uh, and this Q has the property if he's act by construction, if he act with this difference operator on this Q, it actually commutes or it gives E to the two pi I Q tilde sigma. So you can also use uh, functions in this Q as, uh, as, as coefficients in your series expansion. And if you do that, then you, you can write down new solutions, new solutions which have nice analytic properties. Uh, let's say the, uh, the, the solution of this four form around zero, it now is a function of Q and Q tilde. And it, this is now an ordinary logarithm of Q, which we can attribute to a Chen Simons term. If you're interested in that, I can tell you afterwards more about this. Then we have this Q that we had before, but then, there is another piece, which let's call this L plus, which collects uh, the poles uh, or uh, which collects the, the, the poles which enter in order to generate, I mean, to communicate non-poles here to poles there. We collect all these poles, bring poles, poles to this side and the other to the other side. And then uh, we, get a new, uh, uh, we get a new solution. This is also a solution to this Q difference equation but it has nicer uh, analytic behavior because it has no poles, uh, but it still has, and this can, like I said, can be attributed to uh, Chen Simon's terms. It has, has branch cuts with respect to uh, Q tilde and W tilde, which is the inverse of this uh, Q to the minus one. Okay, so let me just, uh, uh, say what what this interpretation is. So there are uh, uh, a couple of comments. If you do this, it actually does diagonalize the Birkhoff matrix. This is another way how you can describe it. Um, it also has an interpretation. So these these variables also have an interpretation, a physics interpretation. So this Q was related uh, to ins uh, inserting. Um, I mean, adding with the Q difference operator corresponds to inserting a Wilson line. Uh, uh, acting, so there's a corresponding dual uh, difference operator. It corresponds to inserting um, um, a dual uh, um, um, a vortex line in, the, in, a, in a certain dual symmetry. So what we are saying is that the non-perturbative completion 
contains these uh, these uh, these uh, these, these uh, dual vortex lines as a background. So the other thing, there, there's a Mellon Barnes type of uh, interpretation, and if you describe a certain contour, which comes from a deep descent method, you also automatically collect these terms. Unfortunately, I didn't have time to talk about this, so there's another way to derive this. If you do other examples, like just a single chiral multiplet, which is the simplest, what you get is uh, the um, the Fadeev quantum dialogarithm, as for instance described in this paper by Garu Palidis and uh, Kashaev, and uh, so maybe we actually hear more about this in your talk, because it turns out if you look at the conifold, uh, the conifold, these generating function, they, they actually coincide for the conifold geometry. So it's not totally clear to us why this is the case with the topological string partition function, uh, where this little Q corresponds to the genus parameter, but just for this specific case. And then it corresponds to the, uh, uh, to the uh, I mean, so, so the, the completion that we got here uh, is similar to the completion that uh, Murat has in his, his works as well. So maybe let me stop here. Well, we've had a lot of questions, um, but there's time for exactly one more uh, before coffee. Uh, sorry, so um, you mean when we do, so you come back to this counting problem? Yes. Uh, okay, so uh, so yes, yeah, so this is one way how you can interpret it. You can actually also, uh, yeah, in kind of a Lando Ginsburg kind of uh, formulation in our first work, we had uh, speculated a bit about this. What's the generalization of the Hori Wacher mirror? And they are, they are structure wise, which uh, things which look uh, quite similar. Uh, this is related to this Mellon Barnes type of story that I hadn't really time to cover. So there's also, uh, similarly as, uh, as, as in 2D, there are certain integral representations of these periods. And this is, uh, so to say, by some contour integral or uh, residue kind of prescription, another way how you can describe, and this is maybe analog a bit of the B model, how you also can describe these periods. But from our perspective, they arise really from this index or from this localization perspective. So you don't need to talk about these periods if you're just interested in these invariants, but uh, these uh, these generating functions, uh, they fulfill this Q difference equation, then you then you can uh, go from there and try to get the mirror interpretation that it works. Right, well, let's uh, thank Hans once again. So 4.15, um, we have a talk by David Favero. It's um, remote, so we have to be here on time. Because...